Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Cintas Corporation announces fiscal 2024 first quarter earnings release conference call. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Mr. Jared Mattingly, Vice President, Treasurer, and Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you for joining us. With me is Todd Schneider, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Mike Hansen, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. We will discuss our fiscal 2024 first quarter results. After our commentary, we will open the call to questions from analysts. The Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 provides a safe harbor from civil litigation for forward-looking statements. This conference call contains forward-looking statements that reflect the company's current views as to future events and financial performance. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, which could cause actual results to differ materially from those we may discuss. I refer you to the discussion on these points contained in our most recent filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'll now turn the call over to Todd. Thank you, Jared. We are pleased with our start to fiscal year 2024. First quarter total revenue grew 8.1% to $2.34 billion. Each of our businesses continue to execute at a high level. The benefits of our strong volume growth and revenue flow through to our bottom line. Operating income margin increased 110 basis points to an all-time high of 21.4%, and diluted EPS grew 9.1% to $3.70. I thank our employees whom we call partners, for their continued focus on our customers, our shareholders, and each other. Uniform rental and facility services operating segment revenue for the first quarter of fiscal 24 was $1.83 billion compared to $1.7 billion last year. The organic revenue growth rate was 7.6%. While price increases moved near historical levels, revenue growth continues to be driven mostly from increased volume. Our sales force continues to add new customers and penetrate and cross-sell our existing customer base. Businesses prioritize all we provide, including image, safety, cleanliness, and compliance. Our first aid and safety services operating segment revenue for the first quarter was $260.7 million compared to $234.2 million last year. The organic revenue growth rate was 11%. Our value proposition continues to resonate in our first aid and safety services operating segment. Health and safety of employees remains top of mind. We provide businesses with access to quick and effective products and services that promote health and well-being in the workplace. Our fire protection services and uniform direct sale businesses are reported in the all other segment. All other revenue was $254.8 million compared to $234.5 million last year. The fire business revenue was $174.3 million, and the organic revenue growth rate was 14.2%. The uniform direct sale business revenue was $80.5 million, which was down 2.7% organically compared to last year. Now, before turning the call over to Mike to provide details of our first quarter results, I'll provide our updated financial expectations for a fiscal year. We are increasing our financial guidance. We are raising our annual revenue expectations from a range of $9.35 billion to $9.5 billion to a range of $9.4 billion to $9.52 billion, a total growth rate of 6.6 to 8%. Also, we are raising our annual diluted EPS expectations from a range of $13.85 to $14.35 to a range of $14 to $14.45 a growth rate of 7.8 to 11.2%. Mike? Thanks, Todd, and good morning. Our fiscal 2024 first quarter revenue was $2.34 billion compared to $2.17 billion last year. The organic revenue growth rate adjusted for acquisitions and foreign currency exchange rate fluctuations was 8.1%. Gross margin for the first quarter of fiscal 24 was $1.14 billion, compared to $1.03 billion last year, an increase of 11%. Gross margin 
as a percent of revenue with an all-time high <clears throat> excuse me, of 48.7% for the first quarter of fiscal 24, compared to 47.5% last year, an increase of 120 basis points. Strong volume growth <clears throat> and continued operational efficiencies help generate this record gross margin. Energy expenses comprised of gasoline, natural gas, and electricity were a tailwind, decreasing 50 basis points from last year. Please keep in mind that some of the energy benefit is the result of efficiencies we've created with our proprietary smart truck technology. Certainly, we've also seen a benefit from a drop in prices at the pump compared to a year ago. Gross margin percentage by business was 48.1% for uniform rental and facility services, 55.9% for first aid and safety services, 49% for fire protection services, and 38.7% for uniform direct sale. Operating income of $500.6 million compared to $440.1 million last year. Operating income as a percentage of revenue was 21.4% in the first quarter of fiscal 24, compared to 20.3% in last year's first quarter, an increase of 110 basis points. Our effective tax rate for the first quarter was 19.2%, compared to 14.8% last year. The tax rates in both quarters were impacted by certain discrete items, primarily the tax accounting impact for stock-based compensation. Net income for the first quarter was $385.1 million, compared to $351.7 million last year. This year's first quarter diluted EPS of $3.70, compared to $3.39 last year, an increase of 9.1%. Cash flow remains strong. Net cash provided by operating activities in the first quarter grew 13% over the prior year. On September 15th, we paid shareholders $138.3 million in quarterly dividends, an increase of 17.8% from the amount paid the previous September. Todd provided our annual financial guidance related to the guidance. Please note the following. Fiscal 24 interest expense is expected to be $98 million compared to $109.5 million in fiscal 23, predominantly as a result of lower variable rate debt. Our, our fiscal 24 effective tax rate is expected to be 21.3%. This compares to a rate of 20.4% in fiscal 23. The higher effective tax rate negatively impacts fiscal 24 EPS guidance by about 16 cents and diluted EPS growth by about 120 basis points. Our financial guidance does not include the impact of any future share buybacks. Guidance includes the impact of having one more work day in fiscal 24 compared to fiscal 23. This, this extra work day comes in our fiscal third quarter. Jared? That concludes our prepared remarks. Now we are happy to answer questions from the analysts. Please ask just one question and a single follow-up if needed. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone now, and you, you will be placed in the queue and order received. Please be, uh, please, please be prepared to ask your question when prompted. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone now. <coughs> and our first question comes from Liza Alwi from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you, and good morning. Um, wanted to see if you could provide a bit more color on the new business environment, and you know if you've noticed any you know any change in terms of um, the the macro environment. Uh, certainly, you guys are you know talking to your customers every day. So just a bit more pers perspective around what you're seeing out there in the marketplace. Great. Good morning, Faiza. Uh yeah, our new business pipeline is uh, is quite good. Uh, we we love uh, the state of our sales organization. Um, you know, their uh, the focus that they have, the uh, the scope, um, and um, so uh, new business is is quite good, and uh, and that's a, a big driver of our of our growth that you're uh, that you're seeing, uh, and uh, and we see that uh, continuing. As far as uh, macro environment. Um, 
you know, it is, uh, we haven't seen any uh, real change in our, our customers' behavior, um, I would say, um, uh, and since uh, we reported last. So uh, it's pr pretty consistent what we've seen um, uh, over the past few quarters. And uh, we um, uh, are watching it very, very closely uh, and monitoring it as, as we move forward. Great, thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Manav Petnake from Barclays. Please go ahead, Manav. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to uh, see if you could give us a little bit more color. I think you know, in terms of the pricing strategy, and then also the strong volume growth. So I think you said pricing is back to historical levels. So you know, I'm guessing that's down. You know, in that low single digit camp versus, you know, almost every other company talking about still, I guess, pricing higher than above an average. So just maybe the first question is just, you know, how do we think about, you know, your pricing strategy here? Mm -hmm. Yes, good morning, Manav. Um, yeah, it is certainly closer to historical levels, and, you know, uh, we like that. That's, uh, we think, appropriate um, based upon uh, our cost inputs. Uh, but we are, um, um, we're very proud of the fact that we're growing our, our business attractively, uh, and we think we can continue this um, based upon new business being uh, robust and, uh, and, our, and our customer retention levels being uh, very good as well. Uh, and we're seeing that in our in our customer satisfaction scores as well, and um, and then the um, uh, the status of our of our customers is you know the um, uh, they're 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 continuing on in the operating environment uh, as they have in the past. So um, uh, so we like where we're positioned. We like the momentum in our business, and um, and we like how we're growing it as well. And uh, we think it's um, it, it bodes well for the future. Monav, I might just uh, add. Monav, I, I might just add to that. You know, you ask about our pricing strategy, and, and as we've talked in the past, um, our, our goal is operating margin improvement, right? And, and pricing can be a, a lever within that, but we have other levers. It's not the only way for us to improve, improve margins. And, um, and, and so, as we think about the operating margin um, strategy of, of increasing. We've got a lot of good things going on, and, and this is a great quarter that shows uh, where pricing is, is sort of returning back to uh, that, that historical level. We still increase margins quite nicely, uh, even to record levels. Uh, and, and um, you know, again, it's just uh, pricing is a part of that strategy. Yeah, that makes sense. That's 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 quite impressive. And then maybe just on the strong volume growth, could you just help uh, provide some color on you know how much of that is you know new business, cross selling, maybe share gains, any 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 color around that? Yeah, good question, Manav. I mean, it's uh, it's everything. Um, uh, as I mentioned, our new is quite good, uh, and our retention levels uh, we're we're very happy with, and. Um, and we're cross-selling, and uh, and we've uh, we're continuing to make good progress there. Um, we're never satisfied, but uh, but our value proposition is resonating with our customers, and um, and we're trying to make it easier to do business with us uh, through uh, various technologies, and um, and I think it's showing up uh, in in our results, and um, uh, we're uh, again uh, bullish. Got it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And our next question comes from Josh Chan from UBS. Please go ahead, Josh. Hi, good morning, Todd, Mike, and Jared. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I guess, uh, could I ask about inflation and what you're seeing across your different cost buckets, labor, energy, material, and, and how you expect that to kind of transpire over the, the coming quarters as well? Yeah, good morning, Josh. Yeah, I'll start if Mike uh, wants to uh, chime in as well. Um, yeah, well, so <clears throat> what we're seeing from a, an input cost standpoint, um, uh, labor is still um, uh, higher than historical, uh, but um, uh, to Mike's point earlier, we're finding ways to improve operating margin in that environment still. And, uh, and part of it is because uh, productivity is, is quite attractive. And, uh, and we're, we're trying to position our, 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 our uh, employee partners um, so that they can be more successful in the in the marketplace, uh, which is good for them and it's good for uh, for ourselves and uh, and, uh, and obviously um, with that uh, retention levels uh, of our of our employee partners, 
uh, being uh, much back or back uh, close, very close to historical levels. Um, it uh, that's good for our customers as well. Uh, other input costs, um, uh, you, you saw where energy was down um, uh, year over prior. Um, <clears throat> that is really a Q1 subject because if you recall last year, uh, the price at the pump uh, was very high. Um, and uh, so we, a little bit of a tailwind there, uh, but we, we think that will be uh, uh, pretty muted uh, through, through the balance of the, uh, the fiscal year. Uh, and then last, the material cost. Our, our uh, global supply chain team is doing uh, one heck of a job in um, in trying to make sure that we're well positioned to have uh, uh, very competitive prices uh, and access to all that product. Uh, and uh, we've spoken in the past about how uh, a very small percentage of our products are single source, so uh, that uh, that positions us well. Uh, as far as having access to product, but also being uh, given them at, at very competitive rates. Thanks for the color, Todd. And, and I guess for my follow-up, uh, could you talk about what your capex expectations are this year, and kind of the types of projects that you're you're investing in? Thank you. Sure, we did see a little bit of an increase in capex in Q1. Um, we are, uh, as we've talked, uh, we are. Um, in the midst of implementing SAP for our fire protection business, and that adds a little bit uh, of, uh, of CapEx. You know, in the first quarter, we also saw um, uh, the, over the last couple years, uh, supply chains, our vendors have had some disruption in their ability to deliver uh, trucks uh, being the, the, be the best example. And in the first quarter, we saw a little bit of a catch-up in terms of us receiving more of those trucks and so we, we, uh, we uh, saw a bit of an increase there, too, in the first quarter. I expect for the year that we're going to likely be uh, right around 4%. Um, longer term, we still believe uh, 35 to 4%, but uh, because of SAP and sort of that catch-up, might be a little closer to 4% this year. Great. Uh, thank you, Mike, and thanks both for your time. Thank you. Pleasure. And our next question comes from Heather Balski from Bank of America. Please go ahead, Heather. Hi. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, I was hoping first you could uh, talk about your exposure to the um, auto sector and any exposure you may have to, uh, I guess, some of the current disruption. And then two, if you could um, talk about sort of the end markets, are there any areas where just in this macro you're seeing softness and, and areas where you're, you're seeing strength would be great. Thanks. Good morning, Heather. Uh, yes, we're certainly watching uh, what's going on uh, with the uh, auto worker strike, uh, but it is not uh, affecting us in any material way whatsoever. Um, uh, you know, we have a, a very broad-based um, uh, customer um, uh, base, and uh, and as a result of that, uh, it's, it's not a, uh, affecting us uh, to any material degree whatsoever. Um, and keeping in mind that we have no one customer that's uh, greater than one percent of our revenue, and no uh, even sector that's uh, um, greater than ten percent for three-digit NAIC codes. So um, uh, that uh, that helps us and insulates us a bit. Uh, from from all that, as far as um, you know, the macro environment, it, it really uh, it, it varies based upon um, you know the sector, the geography, um, uh, you know whether they're goods producing or uh, services providing. Um, but the uh, you know the uh, uh, the labor market is uh, a little easier, but still not easy, um, and, uh, and you see that through the uh, you know uh, what we've uh, what we're reading with the job openings. Still nine and a half million job openings, uh, and that affects our customer base uh, from a standpoint of them trying to uh, attract and retain people. And we would love to see those uh, those jobs filled because we think that'd be really good for um, our customers uh, and for the economy in general. Appreciate the color. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Justin Huck from uh, R. W. Baird. Please go ahead, Justin. Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the first aid margins because they've kind of sustainably been, um, you know, higher than they have been historically and, and really, you know, more comparable to the, the uniform rental and the facility services segment. And I guess, you know, the question is, I mean, you know, for years that was kind of a, 
kind of a scale business where you were building it out and it, and it had lower margins. Are, are you at the point now where, like, you know, that business has reached a point where it, it has very comparable margins sustainably to the uniform rental business? Yeah, good morning, Justin. Um, yeah, we we uh, we really like the first aid uh, business. I mean, it's um, that um, uh, it uh, resonates with our customer base. They um, uh, the strong, very uh, strong value proposition uh, uh, is um, is helping our revenue growth. Uh, the mix uh, is is returned uh, closer to historical uh, uh, with uh, first aid and uh, and safety. Um, and Justin, just like our other businesses, we're using um, uh, various technologies to extract inefficiencies out of our business, and and uh, and there, there's certainly no exception to that. Um, I mentioned that our uh, global supply chain team is done doing a great job in, in sourcing product, and uh, and we're benefiting from sourcing there. Um, but yeah, we we see uh, you know certainly uh, there is um, you know running a business is not linear. But um, that being said, we certainly think that, uh, you know, uh, gross margins in excess of 50 are sustainable in that business. Great. great. Um, and then I guess the last one, kind of more procedural, I guess, but um, you did, it looks like in the cash flow, about $56 million, um spending on acquisitions in the quarter, which is a little bit higher than what you guys typically do. Do you have any comments on kind of where that was, um, where we should see the revenue flow from it? Uh, well, I'll start, and, and Mike can chime in. The um, uh, Justin, as you know, we love uh, leveraging our balance sheet for M&A, um, and it's a, it's a, we think it's a great use of cash, uh, and we're uh, re very happy with the fact that we were able to deploy some of the cash to uh, uh, to leverage that opportunity. And uh, and we are uh, acquisitive in um, in all three of our uh, operating segments that are route based. And uh, and we made acquisitions in all three, so uh, in Q1. So uh, we're pleased with that, and we think that'll uh, uh, is a great opportunity for uh, uh, us to bring those uh, customers into the fold, those partners, those employee partners into the fold, and provide more value and cross sell uh, those um, uh, to those uh, those customers that are now part of CentOS. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next question comes from George Tong from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead, George. Hi, thanks. Good morning. In the past, you've talked about strong demand from the healthcare, education, and government verticals in driving uniform rentals growth. Can you discuss the latest trends you're seeing in these end markets and what's fueling the growth? Good morning, George. Yeah, those are uh, you know, those are three great verticals for us. I mean, there, there are three great um, uh, segments of uh, of uh, the North American economy, and um, so yeah, we're we're still seeing uh, outsized growth in those markets. And um, uh, in, and uh, as we've uh, chatted about in the past, um, it's more than just a sales effort. We've organized around them. We've got products uh, for them. We've got technologies for them, and. Um, uh, and that is resonating uh, with with that uh, that customer base. So uh, we think we've chosen them uh, quite well, uh, um, and uh, and there's plenty of runway in uh, in all of them. So uh, yeah, we're uh, again quite uh, quite bullish on on the future of those segments. Got it. Um, and then with respect to margins, your gross margins expanded 60 bips year over year in your uniform segment. Most of that appears to be driven by lower energy costs. Can you discuss puts and takes around uniform gross margins in the quarter and opportunities for additional margin expansion over the remainder of this year that comes above and beyond tailwinds you're seeing from lower energy costs? Yes, uh, George, we're, um, uh, you know, the, the nature of the, the math around our, our business is, um, uh, the rental business is obviously a large percentage of it. And, uh, and we're guiding towards uh, margin expansion uh, for the year. And um, uh, and we we do not see energy being a tailwind for the balance of the year. So we we uh, we expect margin expansion based upon um, certainly leverage on, on revenue growth. Uh, that's going to be helpful. Uh, but we're extracting those inefficiencies out of our business. And as Mike mentioned earlier, we're proud of the fact that you know pricing is is returning back to historical levels. But we're still able to grow operating margin, gross margin, and operating margin. 
at very attractive levels and uh, to uh, to levels that are all time highs. So um, uh, so that's part of our plan, uh, and um, uh, you know uh, our team is executing at a very high level, and uh, we we uh, we expect that that will continue. George, I, I might just reiterate what I mentioned in the prepared remarks that that uh, keeping in mind that the energy benefit that we are getting um, is, is partly uh, because we are working really hard at things like our smart truck uh, um, initiative. So in other words, as we continue to grow really nicely with volumes, we don't need to add as many routes and trucks as we have in the past. And that creates then better uh, uh, fuel efficiency, if you will, throughout our network. And so that's a, it, it is a proactive um, uh, initiative to get energy down and, and one of those proactive ways is through that smart truck technology. And Mike, I might add that uh, you know when we uh, extract those inefficiencies out, that's better for our customers because we're able to spend more time in front of them instead of on the road. Uh, it's certainly better for our partners, our employee partners, because um, uh, it, it makes them that much more productive, and that's that's good for them and our and, and our organization. Uh, and, and it's really good for the environment. So um, we think, uh, you know, it's a, uh, there's a lot of boxes checked there, and uh, we've worked hard on that technology over the years, and, uh, and it's showing up, and, um, and it's, uh, it's benefiting uh, not just uh, uh, the P&L in a, uh, a more simplistic fashion, but in, in many ways. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Tim Mulrooney from William Blair. Please go ahead, Tim. Hey, this is Sam Kupferman for Tim. Thanks for taking our questions here. Uh, I guess I want to start uh, with another healthcare uh, question here. Um, but as it relates to your healthcare clients, you, you've talked a lot about the opportunity here, uh, especially as more no programmers convert. But I guess I'd like to know for those healthcare operators who, who already use a service partner, uh, what do you think your penetration rate is, and, and how might that compare to some of your other customer verticals? Uh, Sam, that's a good question. I, I don't have that in front of me, um, but we we know this. We're in the early innings uh, with healthcare, um, and we're coming up with more products and services that uh, that they uh, uh, they find attractive, and that's part of our culture. Um, uh, you know, we will enter into a business. Um, but then we we get out from behind our desk and we go spend time with our customers and when we find that we we find the answers to what they are most interested in by speaking to them and our, our customers and our employee partners and um, and and we're hearing from them uh, in various areas where we can help them and uh, and we're we're taking action there so uh, again a very long runway in uh, in that vertical. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's, again, part of our culture and uh, will be uh, part of how we go to market uh, moving forward. Gotcha. Appreciate it. Um, maybe just a, another quick one on the margins. Uh, I see SG&A as a percentage of sales picked up again uh, in the quarter compared to last year. Uh, I guess I'm wondering if there was any variable costs like your insurance expenses or if it was mainly some of the selling and branding investments you've talked about previously. Maybe you could just uh, help break that out for us a little more. Uh, nothing, nothing unusual in the quarter. We did see the, uh, you know, we talked in the fourth quarter about uh, some claims um, getting higher, but, but not structural. We saw those come back down to something more uh, normal. But uh, as it relates to the quarter, just some puts and takes, nothing uh, of any significance. Our, our goal is to continue to leverage, uh, particularly, particularly the G&A uh, uh, piece of that, and uh, we're going to continue to work at that. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Andrew, Andrew Steinerman from J.P. Morgan Securities. Please go ahead, Andrew. Hi. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about incremental uh, margins, which were super strong uh, in the quarter and, and last quarter on a year-over-year -year basis. I surely know Cintas historically has targeted 20 to 30 percent as a range for incremental margins, but you know, kind of given where we are right now, it definitely feels like that kind of low end of the range, the 20, might not be as appropriate. And so my question is, you know, has your medium-term range for incremental margins been creeping up? 
Good morning, Andrew. Uh, yeah, 20 to 30 percent is our target. We um, uh, uh, Q1 was uh, very attractive uh, incremental margins, and there's you know there's always puts and takes uh, in, in every quarter. Um, as uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, running a business is not linear, but we will expect that um, uh, that uh, we will be in that 20 to 30 percent range. Uh, I certainly like higher uh, in the range than uh, than lower. And um, uh, we are, and I think our guide speaks to where um, uh, 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 attractive uh, margin improvement uh, for the year as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Seth Weber from Wells Fargo. Please go ahead, Seth. Uh, hey guys, good morning. Um, I want to ask just about the small uh, tick down in uniform direct sales, organic growth here in the quarter. Um, it's the first, I think, decline that we've seen there in a while. I, I know the comp was hard. Is there anything else that you'd call out there uh, for that business? Thanks. Yeah, good morning, Seth. Uh, uh, you know, certainly well, we have seen uh, outstanding performance uh, from that business uh, over the past really two years. Um, and um, uh, but it is uh, as we've spoken about in the past, uh, the uniform direct sale business tends to be a little bit lumpier uh, based upon rollouts of large programs, uh, whether it's hospitality or uh, a Fortune 1000 type customer. So um, uh, nothing more than that. Uh, we, we still are, uh, are um, bullish on the um, uh, on, on the future of that business and uh, for for the year and and moving forward. Do you, do you think, Todd? Do you think that business could be uh, up for the year, or do you think that's kind of flattish or down? Uh, uh, I would suspect. Well, we expect all of our businesses to grow, so um, uh, so uh, I would suspect that uh, uh, we would see that up. Uh, but just the comps are, are you know, uh, uh, Seth, with you know uh, the the level of, of of what we dealt with with hospitality uh, in um, uh, in that vertical in Fortune 1000, uh, the um, uh, the level of, of where employees came back uh, so strongly. Um, uh, I wouldn't suspect that you'll see, you know, uh, anywhere near the level of growth that we've seen in the um, in the last couple of years, uh, but we expect it to grow. Seth, I, I, I might uh, point out that uh, you know the last two years have they have been uh, a, a significant recapture of what we sort of lost in that pandemic period of time. Uh, in our fiscal 22, that business grew organically over 50%. Uh, in fiscal 23, it was almost 30%. So there was a lot of recapture going on. But but keep in mind that that our longer term goal for that business, Todd Todd expects uh, it to grow, but it's probably more of a low single digit uh, to mid uh, single digit grower um, in our portfolio. Right. Okay. Understood. Thank you. And then maybe just on the um, the first aid safety business, given the margin strength that you're seeing there. Can you talk about, are you seeing any incremental uh, competition in that space? Are you seeing any, you know, bigger players trying to get into that space or just smaller regional players getting more active? Thank you. Yeah, a good question, Seth. Certainly, it's a very competitive marketplace. Um, and, uh, you know, first aid uh, products, uh, safety products, um, uh, there is uh, hundreds of competitors out there. There's many, many ways to procure those products, whether it be van delivered or um, uh, e-commerce, um, uh, you, you name it, uh, we see it there. Um, uh, but as a result of that, it's a very competitive market. And, uh, uh, and you know, we've talked about the, the health and safety of, uh, of employees being uh, the number one item that uh, businesses are focused on. Uh, and when that occurs, uh, there's certainly it attracts uh, plenty of people into the marketplace because the the value proposition of, of taking great care of employees uh, is is resonating with folks. And um, so yeah, it's a very competitive environment, and uh, I'm sure it'll continue to be. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Thank you. And our next question comes from Stephanie Moore Jeffries. Please go ahead, Stephanie. 
Hi, good morning. Thank you. Actually, maybe continuing on, on that last question there, could you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of the competitive landscape and your more uh, core uniform ancillary product se um, segment? Um, you know, as you continue to win new business, where are you seeing the, the majority of the, that new business coming from? Is it, you know, non-programmers, some of the regional players, larger players, any color there to be helpful? Thank you. Yes, good morning, Stephanie. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, I've been in the uniform rental uh, um, and facility services business my entire career, 34 years. It's been highly competitive my entire career, and I'm sure it'll continue to be that way. Um, uh, but I, I, we haven't seen a change in the, in the landscape. It's always really competitive. So, uh, that being said, uh, we, uh, our sales organization um, is uh, highly skilled. And, uh, uh, and what we know is there is a massive opportunity with the no program market. And, uh, and uh, for years, our organization has been focused on expanding the pie, and they are continuing to do exactly that. Um, and and when, we, when we talk about expanding the pie, they are, uh, you know, those, those uh, employees at a, at a no programmer, I mean, they're wearing garments, right? It's, uh, uh, but they, are, they may be buying it themselves. They may be buying it um, through a catalog. Uh, they, uh, it might be a centralized program for the company, but they're, uh, they're, they're purchasing them. Uh, and then we uh, provide more value to them with uh, uh, the, the products and services that we offer, whether they're um, unique products like Carhartt or ChefWorks or Landau, uh, brand, great branded programs. Um, but uh, the no program market is really attractive for us, uh, and we find that uh, our, uh, that market sees really good value in what we're offering, uh, so we're focused on expanding that pie, and uh, that will continue. Got it. And just a follow-up, um, if I may, you, you noted that retention levels, you know, continue to be really high. I'm just curious, in this current environment, what do you think is resonating the, the most with your customers as your sales force kind of goes in? Is it kind of the willingness to work with them on price? Is it the product offering, your scale? Love to just get your thoughts on what do you think is resonating the most to drive to such a, a nice retention level? Thanks. Yeah, great question, Stephanie. That's a, a very complicated answer because there's so many inputs to it. Um, but it starts with uh, being highly focused on taking incredibly good care of our customers um, and attracting and retaining uh, the very best people, uh, but then giving them um, uh, products, services, tools, uh, so that uh, they uh, can not only have the intent to take great care of our customers, but but do just exactly that. So. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that gets into uh, great products uh, that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, the service uh, uh, focus that we're, or the tools that we're making it to, to make it easier to do business with us. Um, but, uh, but it gets down to our people uh, and positioning them uh, to uh, take really, really good care of our, our customers uh, and, uh, and them executing on that. And they're executing at a really high level. And... Uh, and you know, we talk often about you know when markets when when things are challenging when it's it's hard to attract people when it's hard to uh, to procure products when it's hard to uh, operate in the in the marketplace uh, it gives us a chance to shine and our culture uh, is shining through uh, and our people are doing one heck of a job and, and taking care of our customers. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. And our next question comes from Scott Schneeberger from Oppenheimer. Please go ahead, Scott. Uh, thanks. Good morning. Um, you guys, you, you've certainly um, – it, it sounds like you really want to speak to, um, to a smart truck because that's been going very well. I was hoping you could add also on automation to facilities. And where I'm going here, just a, kind of an update, and where I'm going here is it sounds like you've been getting nice efficiencies and you still see more room to run. Is there any quantification you can put on that? I know you're looking for margins up this year overall business, but um, maybe just help us uh, get an idea of what's at play there and how much you can do. Thanks. You know, Scott, uh, I'll start. Mike, if you would like to chime in there. Um, uh, you know, we are, we're, we're um, deploying technology, um, and you can call it automation, you can call it technology, you can call it uh, digital. Um, we're deploying that across uh, all of our businesses and across all areas of our business as well. Um, 
uh, and we've been uh, we've been focused on that for years. Um, but there there certainly is um, um, you know we're seeing some real benefits there uh, with our investment with SAP. Uh, we're with our, our investments, um, our partnerships with uh, with Google and uh, uh, and with Verizon, uh, and it's uh, uh, those are uh, we we see um, uh, that there's there's plenty of uh, opportunity still to come there to improve in the efficiencies um, uh, of our business and to um, uh, and to automate uh, certain functions and you know, we call it make it easier for our customers to do business and make it easier for our employee partners to take great care of our customers uh, the more we can um, uh, we can invest there we think it's a, a incredibly good use of our balance sheet uh, because it uh, positions us well for uh, uh, not just the short term but the long term as well yeah, there are so many details that go into all of the things that Todd just uh, talked about that it's really hard to put a number on uh, on it. Uh, our goal is, as, as you've heard us say, is continue to improve margins. We have a number of different levers to do so. Um, our, our goal is incrementals uh, in that 20 to 30 uh, percent range, recognizing we're we're at the bottom of that range today. But it's hard to it's hard to uh, put a, a specific number on what's left. Uh, because we're always on, we're always working on um, what's what more can we do, and there are all, there are so many details and so many different projects we're working on. So, our guide uh, certainly does imply for continued uh, margin improvement uh, over last year, and uh, that's the way we think about it. Great, thanks, guys. Appreciate that. The um the you just referenced SAP and you mentioned CapEx may be high into the range this year. Um, working on some implementation in in, um, in the fire segment, um, could you just speak to um, you know is it, will that have a tail to next year? How much more? Uh, I mean, are we going to see SAP projects for years to come? Just a just a sense of, um, of 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 what you have on the spend side going forward. Thanks. From a from a fire perspective, you know uh, the the um, the implement. We are in the midst of of the early innings of the implementation, and so we'll see uh, we'll see some some pressure in the fire margins a little bit this year, uh, and uh, a little bit next year. Though the the synergies and the benefits don't come overnight. Uh, it's not a flip of the switch, and so we just like we did with uh, the rental business and the first aid business before that. Uh, we need to get onto the platform. It takes a little bit of time to get really good at using the platform, uh, and then we really start to see the the uh, benefits accelerate, just like we have in in uh, first aid and rental. Now, uh, you know that's uh, that's a fire is a smaller part of our business, but we certainly expect that uh, th those uh, benefits will come. As it relates to SAP, you know SAP is not it, it's a journey, right? And and uh, we're we are even though we are on SAP and will be for most of our business after the fire protection business gets on, um, there, there are constant things to learn from SAP. There are new initiatives in working with SAP and Google and Verizon that create new and different things. And, um, and so we, we look at this, uh, I think Todd's talked about it as one of his, his, uh, his largest initiatives in terms of technology. And it's a journey. It's not a. It's not a, uh, a flip of the switch. We turn on new systems here and there. <clears throat> so we're in the midst of that. We'll continue to, to uh, invest in in all of that. And um, our expectation is it's going to continue to bring benefits uh, into the future. Yes, yeah, Scott. Uh, uh, to expand upon what Mike said, uh, it is a journey. Um, but uh, when you're on that journey, there is a benefits, um, uh, a long, long tail of benefits as well. And uh, so we will continue to invest appropriately. We have relationships at a very high level uh, in, in each of those organizations, um, and it's going to bear fruit for us. And, um, uh, and that's part of our plan. It's not easy. Uh, it's very challenging um, uh, to, uh, to go through these processes, uh, but our, our team has shown uh, the wherewithal to not only uh, digest the change, uh, but then uh, leverage uh, the opportunities that are in front of them. Great. Thanks, guys. Yes, sir. And our next question comes from Shlomo Rosenbaum. Please go ahead, Shlomo. Hi. Thank you for taking my questions. 
Hey, uh, Todd, maybe you can just peel the onion back a little bit more on that margin on the first aid side. I know you pointed to some sourcing and, and stuff like that, but it, it seems like the business has gone from mid-teens to low 20s in the course of the year. And I was wondering if there's, is there something to do with route optimization? Is it mix-related pricing? Anything else that operationally made such a significant difference? And, um, you know, after that, I have uh, just a question on the labor environment for you guys yourselves. Are you, or is it easier for you guys to source people for what you need? Uh, uh, good question, Shlomo. Yeah, again, we we love the uh, first aid business, um, uh, but we're, there's so many inputs to uh, margin expansion, and and we're leveraging them all. It starts with really good revenue growth, and we're we're seeing that, um, and that's in a big way because the value proposition is resonating. Uh, the products, the services that we we offer, um, you know, uh, in the marketplace, uh, uh, trying to attract and retain people. Is, is still challenging and, uh, um, and people are trying to, uh, customers are trying to take really good care of their people and, uh, and we're benefiting from that uh, and, we're, and we're helping them accomplish exactly that. We're helping them run that business, their business better. Uh, so, uh, so that's helpful. The mix, uh, as you know, has, um, you know, uh, back during the pandemic, it was certainly so much more focused on safety products. A lot of gloves and a lot of sanitizer and those types of items, uh, and that has uh, uh, abated a bit uh, and um, uh, in the mix is uh, back focused on, uh, you know, first aid and, and, uh, and those types of products, more uh, recurring revenue type. Um, and, yeah, we are absolutely leveraging technology to make it easier to do business, uh, but also to position our partners, our employee partners, to provide more value to our customers. And Smart Truck is a component of that. Um, you know, we did have a little bit of energy tailwind, 40 uh, basis points. Uh, but as Mike uh, cited earlier, not all that's because of the price at the pump. That is um, also because we are extracting the inefficiencies out. And uh, we always talk around here about how uh, we don't make money when the wheels are moving. We make money when the wheels stop. That's better for our customers. That's better for our employee partners. Uh, and, uh, uh, and all that is contributing. And then lastly, as I mentioned, our supply chain team has done a great job. Um, they are uh, leveraging the opportunities there. The larger we get in that business, uh, the more leverage they have, and uh, and they're they're executing at a high level. And uh, so many inputs that are contributing to it. And uh, but the what's uh, what's really encouraging is uh, we see uh, those uh, having um, uh, an opportunity to continue in the future. So uh, certainly no event. Uh, it's more of a process. And then just the labor environment on your own, like for the people that you're sourcing? Yeah, pardon me. Um, uh, so uh, from a labor standpoint, it, um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, it is uh, easier but not easy. Um, and uh, we are looking for uh, great people. Uh, you know, we want to hire not only people that are employed uh, somewhere else, but happily employed, uh, which is <laughs> very challenging, uh, and uh, but we think we have uh, a great um, uh, employee value proposition as well, and uh, so um, so we're we're highly focused on that. Um, so, but yes, easier than it was a year ago. Uh, but um, uh, uh, but uh, say Shlomo, throughout my career, it's always been challenging. Uh, it's uh, it's a little bit more challenging than it has been historically, but uh, but not uh, what it once was, uh, you know, a year ago or so. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Kartik Mehta from North Coast Research. Please go ahead, Kartik. Hey, good morning. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions and maybe thoughts on what happens to new sales, and I'm wondering. You know, if you go back to kind of 2008, 2009, and hopefully never have that recession again, but if you look at new sales back then, how did uh, how did Cintas perform uh, for new sales? And any lessons from that you would take uh, as we move forward? Uh, yes, Kardik. Well, you know, first of all, we're a really different company today than we uh, we were in 2008, 2009. We're um, we have a much more diversified customer base. You know, we're now today, 
70% uh, of our customers are services providing, 30% are, are goods producing. Uh, we have uh, significant verticals that we didn't have uh, as well, uh, healthcare, education, government. Um, so um, uh, we think we're really well positioned uh, uh, for uh, whenever the next recession is. Um, and, uh, and I remember uh, 08, 09, because I was running the sales organization back then, and uh, you know, our value proposition still resonated with, with people. Um, and we still sold new business, and, uh, and we did so at attractive rates. As I mentioned, uh, it's not always are we asking for new monies. Uh, sometimes it's just a redirection of those from somewhere else to us, not only in a maybe a direct competitor stand, uh, standpoint, but also, uh, you know, they're they're purchasing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, clothing. They're purchasing items to take care of the facilities. Um, so uh, we think we're we're well positioned. Uh, I might also mention you, you you didn't ask specifically about it, but you know, uh, we love having a, a pristine balance sheet, uh, and uh, and we think uh, whenever the next recession is, that might open up opportunities for us. Uh, and just the fact that we've, um, you know, our, our organization is focused on, um, you know, fighting through whatever the economic environment is, taking great care of our, our of our customers, taking great care of our employee partners, and we've grown sales in 52, 52 of the last 54 years, um, and uh, we suspect that uh, uh, that whatever the uh, economic environment is, we we believe we're going to be successful at. Kartik, I might I might add um, Todd might be a, a little modest. He was running that organization. It was a difficult environment, and and uh, he and the sales team exceeded their internal goals, and and really um, continued to show that value even in tough times, as Todd mentioned. And 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 as he also talked about, our our uh, customer base is quite a bit broader than it was back then, and our sales team is a little bit different. But the really good news is even back then, in the deepest, longest, broadest recession we'd seen in 100 years, uh, we still sold a lot of new business, um, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice reflection of the value proposition that we have. Yeah, uh, thanks. And just as a follow-up, if you look at that first aid and safety business, you're doing really well in it. Is there a way you would look at to say a certain percentage is recurring? Do you consider a certain percentage recurring? I know you don't have long-term contracts in that business, but just from a demand standpoint and what you've seen from a historical standpoint. Yes, uh, Cardi, uh, it's a good question. Um, I don't have that in front of me, but um, uh, but uh, I know it's uh, it has returned much closer to historical or even higher um, uh, as far as uh, what we see from a, a, a repeat, uh, reoccurring type of revenue. Um, and you know, we want to provide value to the customers. You know, uh, whatever product services they want, um, it's just the nature of it. What we provide, whether it be um, uh, uh, first aid supplies, um, you know, um, uh, access to um, uh, AEDs, access to eye wash stations, um, uh, access to clean water um, uh, through our water break um, uh, offering. Um, those are all items that are really important to uh, our customers, uh, more so today than they were pre-pandemic, and, um, and we think that uh, that trend will continue. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. And our next question comes from Tony Kaplan from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead, Tony. Thank you so much. Uh, so one of your competitors has been talking about using a strategy where they're incentivizing their drivers to cross-sell products. Can you talk about why you don't use that strategy, You know what the disadvantages are that you have found when doing that? Yeah, uh, great question, Tony. I'm glad you asked because, um, you know, um, uh, my first job 34 years ago was on the trucks, and um, uh, and we have been cross-selling our products via our, uh, we call them our service sales representatives. We've been cross-selling them since I started, and I'm sure it was, it was in place well before I, I started as well. So we see uh, the fact that we have um, – 
uh, 12,000 or so trucks that roll out of our parking lots every single day to, that uh, are focused on taking great care of our customers. Um, uh, when they roll out of those parking lots, they're, they're spending time in those businesses. And uh, they have eyes, they have ears, they have minds, and, uh, and they see what's going on in those businesses, and they see opportunities. And it always has been and always will be a key component of our growth um, trajectory um, because uh, we see that infrastructure as a real advantage and uh, and we leverage it and make sure that uh, those service providers, either they provide more products and services or they provide a lead to provide more products and services um, uh, based upon uh, the nature of the product uh, that, uh, that the customer might be interested in. And, and Tony, uh, the, you know, we've talked a lot about this over the, over the last more than 10 years, um, we've got customers of all different sizes, uh, verticals, et cetera. And so, and, and so while we do certainly uh, expect those service sales reps to continue to penetrate and sell, uh, we recognize that some businesses are just more complex than others, are larger than others. And so sometimes there, there is a, there's a, a strategy to, uh, enhance uh, th that opportunity, uh, and it might be through, for example, in, in, in healthcare, we have dedicated people that, that really do uh, reach out to the decision maker. So it's not just the service sales rep, but it's also uh, other people that have relationship uh, responsibilities that are looking for those uh, new and different penetration opportunities. It's not as simple just to simply say, we're going to go in and have a, 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 a service sales rep or an SSR go into each customer and sell. It's, it, all customers are so different. And so we, we need a strategy that can attack all types of customers, and we do. Tony, we know that um, uh, our customer satisfaction scores are really good, and um, uh, in, in large part because they really like our people. They, they like our, our service providers, our frontline service providers. Uh, and we leverage that, and um, uh, whether it be, as Mike mentioned, uh, a, a more uh, uh, a smaller type customer, we can um, uh, uh, cross sell via the service provider. A larger one that's uh, a little bit more complicated, uh, there might be uh, a need for some uh, some air cover for some help there. Uh, but nevertheless, that's always been a, an important component of our strategy, and uh, and always will be. That is super helpful. Um, wanted to also ask, I think the last few calls, you've been talking more about technology and investments and, and things of this sort. Are there any, I guess, technology capabilities that you think you still need that you either are getting through hiring technology people or maybe even doing, you know, M&A, like, and maybe you've done it, maybe you still have yet to do, but are there any technology capabilities that you need that, you know, basically would be helped through M&A or hiring internally new technology people? Yeah, Tony, great question. You know, so we are always on the lookout for uh, those opportunities. Uh, we think we have a really strong technology platform uh, that we can build off of. Um, uh, but if, um, uh, but we know that the, the answer for what our customers are interested in is with uh, spending time with our customers, uh, and, our, and our employee partners are the ones who, um, who, who uh, uh, discern those opportunities. Uh, so we're always asking them, you know, uh, how do we make it easier to do business? What, 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 is there any void? Uh, and frankly, that's where... Uh, most of our investments have come from is, uh, is that information and trying to make it easier to do business with us. Uh, so we are uh, we're always in search of and in, in, uh, of trying to be a world class service provider, uh, but having a, an incredibly strong technology platform that makes it easier for uh, our customers to do business with us and makes it easier for our employee partners, our service providers, uh, to uh, create a world class experience for those uh, those customers. So. Um, uh, so yes, we're in search of uh, whether it's uh, we, we buy it or we um, uh, we bolt it on to our current platform uh, or we create it ourselves. 
uh, all of all of those are of interest to us, and uh, and we'll be uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank at you. At this time, at this time, there are no further questions. I'd like to turn the call back over to Jared Mattingly for closing remarks. Thank you for joining us this morning. We will issue our second quarter of fiscal 24 financial results in December. We look forward to speaking with you again at that time. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>